All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, we are sitting down with Zach Bolin, who is the front man for the band Citizens and was also part of Mars Hill Church back in the day. So, Zach, welcome to the podcast. Uh, I've been excited to connect with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> Those are the two biggest things, right? <laughs> right, right. That's it. That's right. So truth be told, I don't have I don't have an agenda today. Mm -hmm. I just really want to hear your story. Uh, I don't have... Yeah. Usually when I have somebody on, like I've, I've read all their books, if they have books, I've listened to a whole bunch of podcasts with them. I have like my list of questions I want to kind of tackle, but I, I have no secrets I'm looking to, to uncover. I've yeah. heard like a little bit of your story on the Deconstructionist podcast. And I think mm -hmm. there was one, I think the Theology of Music or something like that podcast. I listened to like excerpts just to get kind of an idea, but yeah. um, I know, so I know obviously you're part of Mars Hill mm -hmm. uh, with Mark Driscoll. So I'd love to hear about that because I have all sorts of, of feelings as I think some of our listeners do yeah. um, as yeah. well. Uh, like we said, you're the front man of citizens. I believe you re recently released a new EP. Is that correct? That's right. A thousand yeah. shorts. Yeah. Yep. So I'd love to hear more about kind of that and just like how music has maybe played a role in your spiritual journey. And I also know you've done a little bit of deconstructing, whatever word you might want to use. So mm -hmm. I think our our listeners will really kind of jive with that. So yep. if you wouldn't mind, I'm just going to kind of hand it over to you and just lead us into your story a little bit. We'll see where it goes. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So let me, let me start with a little more backstory before we get to Mars Hill. Okay. So <laughs> Build it up. I grew up in, um, I grew up in a small town in Maryland, pretty rural. Um, when I was six, my dad died. Mm. And so I didn't have, I did have some sort of like parental influences in my life, obviously my mom, but it was really hard for her, as you can imagine, losing her husband, having two boys to raise, and that wound up becoming a pretty challenging relationship. Thankfully, it's, mm. there's been a lot of healing there, mm. it was hard. And so I just sort of spent most of my young years really feeling this sense of, all right, I, I need to. I I feel like so much of my life was sort of I don't know, scripted out and I, yeah. I don't like that script. Yeah. I don't like the script of where it involves like me not having a dad and then me having this like really challenging relationship with my mom and then having this really challenging relationship with the place that I was growing up in. And so I just immediately left as soon as I could. So at 18, I moved to Georgia. I went to school there. And uh, when I was there, I got connected to a church. And I was, it was an art, it's an art college in Savannah. And so I was around a bunch of people that couldn't care less about the church. And then I was also like spending some of my weeknights with people that were a part of the church. And so it was always a really interesting like place to be in the middle of that. Sure. And then along the way, I graduated from college and someone offered me a job to work at this church mm -hmm. and I didn't take it mm -hmm. because I just didn't feel like it was for me. And then six months go by in that time I got married and other life things were going on. I was washing windows at the time <laughs> and uh, like on, on tall buildings or just like uh, uh, fronts or... uh, like big houses, like okay. in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Okay. So gotcha. um, not like tall buildings, but some of them were pretty high up. And so anyway, doing that kind of stuff. And then it just got, it just had dried up a lot. It was 2006, 2007. So I needed a job. And so I was like, maybe I'll come back around and, and consider this job. Mm -hmm. So I did. And I remember my first day driving there. I remember praying and just saying out loud, I really don't want to do this job. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this. And I did it anyway. <laughs> and I was there for in that role for I don't know how many years, three or four. And I can honestly say that while the church experience for me was not, I wouldn't, if I was grading it on a scale of one to 10, mm -hmm. uh, I would, it would be quite low <laughs> <laughs> as far as like my experience as a person working on staff. But I, th I got to work with a lot of high school and middle school kids. And that really sort of changed my life. Mm -hmm. It showed me just the power of music and story and my own faith. And it really propelled me to want to aim for something more because so much of my church experience was someone stands up in the front and tells you this is what this is what this thing means sure. scripture or here's a story 
And I'm essentially meant to like emulate this person. It's kind of like, I think it's pitched to a lot of people in churches. And that just didn't really sit well with me. And, and the reason why all this is important is because losing my dad at six, I had this really pretty massive like fear of just grown men. Mm. Like I always felt really uh, inferior around them. And then coupled with, I'm this art student (laughs) and there are all these pastors who haven't lived at all in that world. And I was kind of just like the weird kid that had, you know, a beard at, you know, 18 and looked (laughs) like a homeless guy. (laughs) at this church in Savannah, Georgia, sure. where there wasn't really any beards yet. Um, and so I always had this sense of like, just feeling really inferior. Eventually time moves, moves on. We feel like it's a good time for us to leave. So we moved to St. Louis for a year and honestly didn't know what that would bring. Uh, all along, I was helping this guy out. He had like this ad agency and I was making these videos for him. And mm-hmm. I just enjoyed that, like that side of stuff. And I was really strongly considering not working in the church anymore. And about four months or eight months in, Mm -hmm. after my wife and I, we just like really felt like we were meant to just pray and spend some time like fasting um, Mm -hmm. for like a pretty long time. And we weren't sure what it meant. We were both feeling pretty like displaced and unsure of what the future looked like. We didn't like living in St. Louis. We, there were great people, but it was just, I don't know. We just weren't in love with the place. Mm-hmm. And in that time, my friend Cam calls me and is like, hey, there's this, I'm, you know, you know, we're out here at, in Seattle. And we're part of this church, Mars Hill. Would you like to like interview for this worship director role? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh man, that's kind of crazy because Natalie and I have been talking a lot. Like the big thing that we feel like keeps coming to our mind is we really feel like we want to be in Seattle, Mm -hmm. but we had no, nothing tied to that. To be honest, my first introduction to Mark Driscoll, I was so turned off. (laughs) (laughs) I had this buddy I worked with in St. Louis and I remember him watching this, like, what was it? It was like elephant room or yeah. I something that. like that right it was like td jakes and all the people were yeah there. yeah and it was like he was watching it and i was like who is this guy and then he's like oh no he's good he's good read this read this doctrine book and i start reading it and i'm just like did he even write this book like I, immediately i had all these like apprehensions yeah. and so coming out to mars hill initially when we made the decision it really was for a lot of it was two things one the sense like we really feel like we're meant to be in seattle mm-hmm. And two, we felt like we we just wanted to be out where our friends were. Mm-hmm. And Mars Hill was really more of a vehicle. Mm-hmm. I think at the time I would have, I didn't see it quite like that. I used mm-hmm. more language like, oh yeah, we're going to be part of this church and this will be cool. And, you know, who knows what will happen with Mars Hill music and all this stuff. And so we get out there and I mean, I can tell you like my interview even was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> we had this joke for a long time that was don't take Zach out for Ty and ask him hard questions. <laughs> but, you know, and for a while I was like, like oh, on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I started to realize that, uh, you know, I don't think it was so much on me. I think that there was just a lot of, and I love so many of those guys that were at that lunch that day, but I think there's just like so much insecurity. Mm-hmm. And I see it now in hindsight where it was like, they were asking me questions about like, what, five theology books have you read in the past six months and kind of like setting this like really high bar and standard rush is like I don't I haven't read that you know or Mm -hmm. just kind of felt pretty much like a massive fish out of water Mm -hmm. even to the point where I I got a sense that oh they're probably not going to hire me and I just told the one pastor that I was going to be working with I was like you know I don't really know what you're going to do but I just know that I just my wife and I have spent the past, the better part of the past month really feeling a sense like we're supposed to move to Seattle. So mm-hmm. whether I work here or not, I, we're, we're moving here. And then I think that, I think that conversation really sort of opened that door for us to be moving that way. And so we get to Mars Hill, uh, within a week citizen, I meet like three of the guys that are still in citizens. We start the band we're doing, um, hymn arrangements and stuff like that 
And I didn't, again, I didn't have a whole lot of like Mars Hill's history. Like in some ways, like even for my wife, like listening to the podcast, there were definitely times where she was just like, are we just terrible at making decisions? <laughs> like, <laughs> how did we, how did we move to Seattle? How do we be a part of a church that had so many things that like pretty like uncomfortable and controversial things happening before we even got there? And we've, and, and so that was, that was interesting, like listening to that, because it's like, there was a lot of things as I listened to the podcast, you're like, I didn't even know about that, you know? Mm -hmm. So are uh, the rise and fall podcast. Yeah. So in, anyway, needless to say, we're there, we're part of this predominantly college age church. There are in the mornings, there's like some younger families, but at night it's 700 college students there. Mm -hmm. Really, really, again, just like crazy, uh, hmm just like a life altering experience um, to see people and students come from all around the world, some exchange students, some people that had never even heard about like Jesus and never been to a church all of a sudden are part of this thing that mm -hmm. it is like changing their life. Mm -hmm. And we're writing these songs and every, like every Sunday night we would sing these songs and it's like, these college students are just like, like screaming these lyrics, you know, and it's not like a, it's not like a typical worship thing. I mean, like we're like this rock sort of thing. It's just, but somehow all of it together, there was like this desperation, I think that everybody had and that in many ways, like it sort of shielded me in some ways from a lot of the other, like, I don't know, political and sort of, mm, Maybe I just didn't see as much of the controversial stuff. Mm. But as time went on, I did. Mm. There were little red flags that came, like our lead pastor, he like he left, and it seemed that his reasons for leaving, what he the reason he said he was leaving didn't quite make sense to me because it seemed like maybe there's tension between him and the executive elders and all that. Mm. And that I mean, that was less than a year into being at the church and i mean there were there were other little things that would happen where a guy of some really good friends of ours they moved their whole family just had a baby from the uk <laughs> they're there for six months all along the executive team has said hey we know this is a college church we know it's not going to make any money that's totally fine like we believe and it's presence there and that and the university district so you guys just do your thing so they mm -hmm. approved us to hire these people and then six months in they like let this guy go mm -hmm. for no reason other than they just changed their mind yeah. and it was devastating i mean absolutely devastating and i just remember i just kind of started having these same feelings that i'd had in previous churches that it worked at where the people up up at the top get to make these hard decisions if you will and they sort of get to be these heroes because they made the hard decision mm -hmm. but they're actually not the heroes they're 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 the anti-hero because there are people that have sacrificed and given themselves to something that they really believe in and they move their self they move themselves and their family across the country only to have this thing that they really believe in like turn on them yeah and so that really for my wife and i at that point it just, uh, the floodgates started opening up as far as like a lot of things that we started hearing. Mm -hmm. There were more friends that started leaving the church or quitting their roles or would, would ask me questions sometimes like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. Or mm -hmm. you'd start hearing stories of things that Mark had said or done to other people and no, uh, like zero um, reconciliation or like a plan for like recourse or any sort of conversation mm -hmm. about what had happened and when it had been approached they were shut down or any or just and, and so many stories are just like man this is kind of wild and so you know all all this is happening over the course of three and a half years i think it was three and a half years i think that's right yeah three and a half years we were there for three actually i guess technically we were there for a little under three and a half years but regardless um so a lot happened in that time yeah so then you start to get into like 2013 mm -hmm. 
And even though a lot of the big stories didn't come out until the beginning of 2014, I was hearing about all these things because of just the rumblings. <laughs> you just get in certain situations and you're yeah. like, oh man, okay, really? That's that's what that's how he got on the New York Times bestseller with that book. Seriously. Mm. Or he gets paid what? Or yeah. oh man, he he said that to you? That's crazy. And and just like story after story. And uh eventually. I think March rolls around of 2014. Things are pretty hot at this point. Like a lot of people are talking about it all. And I, they approach me and say, hey, would you be willing to come over to Mars Hill Ballard? Because at the time, there's another guy, Chad Gardner, who has a band King's Kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. And they, he and his wife had just left the church and they were looking for someone to come over and take his spot. I thought about it for a while and just given the circumstances of everything going on, I, I, I mean, I would honestly say maybe even foolishly thought, all right, maybe if we go over there, there is an opportunity to like be a voice of like influence or sure, you know, sure. reason. maybe I can make a change. Yeah, exactly. And that, and honestly, so many people thought that yeah. I, I'm one of many that thought that. Mm. So we move over and I mean, within days of me being there more stuff is coming out and it turns there's another guy there who had been the oldest uh, his let's see he was on staff he's an elder and he he and his wife they were the first people at mars hill to have a kid so they were there at the very 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 beginning mm. and all along sort of the topic of discussion every week was sort of about um him trying to reconcile with Mark and that just not happening. And at the time there was a campus pastor at the Marcel Ballard campus that um, he just, I don't think he had the history to really understand all that this guy was talking about that was pretty hurt by Mark. And so he really sided with the executive elders a lot, which of course brought a lot of tension. And eventually uh, he fired this guy who had been there from the very beginning, basically because he came back from a meeting after meeting with Mark and he said um, that he was asked, did you, do you see any change in Mark? And he was, and he said, no. And then he was fired on the spot because he said he didn't see any change in Mark. And I remember the day he and his wife are, I mean, his wife is like sobbing and he's in tears like a wreck. And no, people are just in their offices. Like, I, I didn't even know, you know, I walk in, I'm like, what is going on? And just like, help them carry boxes out. Just like, this is awful. This is terrible. And I, at this point, I was, just, I, I, I just had had enough. And all along, there was a meeting that was scheduled for me and two other Marshall Music guys to meet with Mark and the executive elders to talk about Marshall Music. And it was going to be coming up. And let's just say this happened on like a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. and then um we're talking about meeting with them and meanwhile we have an elder meeting and i remember in that meeting telling the lead pastor i was just like you're just i, I just don't trust you mm -hmm. i don't know how you could just make a decision like that on your own because of a because of something that you had an expectation for how you thought this person was supposed to see mark because he didn't see him in that way he gets fired and um, and so I, I was feeling the tension there. Sunday rolls around. I'll never forget this. There are people in the congregation. I'm on stage. There's people out in the congregation, and there are so many people that I know that are crying. They look distraught. They've come to church on Sunday to hopefully get some understanding as to why this guy that's been this beloved person in this church for so many people why all of a sudden he's fired and they're in tears and on the screen starts playing this video meanwhile this whole thing was it was you know in the midst of controversy all in itself but it was about the marcel global thing and it was look at everything we've done and it was showing videos of baptisms and we've done all like we're just this amazing church and oh man isn't it so good to be here and i'm just i can't even watch the video because all i can see is people just Falling. broken yeah. yeah and i just i left the stage and i texted the guys and i was like you guys can have the meeting i'm done i'm not i'm not gonna do it i'm mm -hmm. out of here this is ridiculous like this is this is 
this is propaganda. Yeah. I can't, I can't do this. And so they asked, Hey, would you meet just to talk about it? And so to talk about me still meeting with Mark and the other guys. And so I agreed to do that. And I, I did change my mind. I, was, I just said, well, I'll meet with them. I'll meet with them. Let's do it. But I, I, you just got, you guys got to know that I'm, I still feel like I'm not going to be around. Yeah. So I went to the meeting and, um, and I, I think this is, again, as I'm telling all this, like, I think what's important for anyone listening to know is I don't like a lot of the things that I saw at Mars Hill weren't that different from things that I'd seen in other churches, mm -hmm. if I'm being very honest. Sure. You no. Know? So it's Mars Hill is unique in that it was this big church that completely imploded and doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And it had a leader that was globally recognized and a lot of people had a hard time believing that he could be as ruthless as he was. Mm. Um, never because of, and, and we can get into that later, but sure. needless to say, um, we go into this meeting and Mark says to us, we start saying, Hey, we just want to talk about Marshall music. And I can't remember what the main reason was. And he just said, Oh, good. All right. I thought I, I thought I was going to be walking into a hostage situation that you guys are going to be coming in here saying, if you don't give us this, we're leaving. It's like, that's kind of weird. And then at one point, one of the guys said, Mark, you, you really should talk to the church about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And he starts going on this thing about, well, you know, this church, I can't remember what church it was. Actually, I think it was something with Joshua Harris. Mm -hmm. I think he brought him up. Well, if we start, if I do that, then we could have a lawsuit on our hands. If I start, you know, talking about, you know, anything or just like, wait, well, then what is, is there more that we don't even know yeah, about? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. What do you mean? You're going to get, we're going to get sued. Yeah. And, and it just, I remember sitting in the meeting and at one point I looked at Mark and again, going back to the earlier part of my story, a dude who's struggled, who struggled a lot earlier on with just this feeling of like a fear of older men. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting there and I just remember feeling this peace and the sense that I just needed to communicate. Like, you know, I'm like, the reason that I'm here isn't because of like Marcel music. Like, I just care. I really care about these people and they're really hurting. And that's why my family's like still here is because I just feel like we don't want to just abandon ship, you know, yeah. leave them hanging. Mm. But at the same time, I didn't say this, but there was also the tension of like, is staying also creating a problem? Mm -hmm. Because in the same sense, there would be people coming up to me and I know other people and say, oh man, I'm so glad you're here. Cause I know if you're here, then, then there's at least some hope that someone might say something. And that's a lot of pressure for someone yeah. to wear. And then for other people not knowing that that's probably not going to make a difference. Sure. And I remember Mark thanking me and all this stuff. And then later on that night, we had a big video conference elder meeting and he made a comment about how he's like you know marcel is you know of course we've been going through hard stuff but you know it's, we're strong we're strong and all this sort of like propaganda like distraction from reality and he says something to the effect of you know uh, i was talking to a pastor today and he said he would do anything he would he would you know he would he would quit his job if he needed to and or he would give up his paycheck if he needed to and he'd mop the floors and clean the bathrooms and do all this and there was another guy who was on the creative team who was in that meeting with us with mark and everybody and he looked at me and he, and he says that's not what you said <laughs> and um i just was like you know what this is i i i don't know why i'm trying to hang around here like yeah. it's so obvious that staying all the signs not, are right <laughs> yeah the longer i stay here the more complicated it gets yeah so i just called one of the executive elders dave bruskis like i think the next morning and i just said hey man i'm i'm quitting mm -hmm. and he, he just said oh it's really confusing because meeting yesterday you made it sound like you really you know you'd be here no matter what i was like well but when you conflate my words and that's not what i said right. i just simply said i really care about these people people right and i don't and i don't enjoy the fact that they are asking for questions answers i can't even give them because i don't know yeah and it's just it's just not a fair position for him to be in yeah so yeah we left mars hill and june of 2014 
And that's when, and my wife and I really felt this deep sense that I will say too, simultaneously, I was in a place of just feeling like I, it just, it was a perfect storm. I was already feeling like I was like working in the church vocational ministry was just not for me. Yeah. Sure. And so I got to that place. And of course, all right, we're leaving Mars Hill. And it just became apparent like, well, the only reason we would leave this job and then go work at another church would be to pay the bills. And that yeah. just feels like a terrible idea to us. Crap so, place to be in. Yeah. yeah. So we're just like, we're not going to do that. So we, we took, we stepped away from it and we just took some time and talked to the band and we just proposed like, what if we just, what if we do the band full time? Mm-hmm. And everyone was on board with that. And we just started doing that. And that's what we've been doing for, you know, really the better part of seven, eight years now yeah. full time. Wow. And that's been really cool that it lives on despite all the other Mars Hill stuff. And of course, like there's so many things after Mars Hill. I mean, just the challenges it, it, it was it, it hurt a lot of relationships because there were a lot of people that stuck around that really believed that they could do something yeah. and I was just everything in me trying to say like you can't you can't you can't like this they don't want to change like mm-hmm. you're wasting time and you're just perpetuating something that just is inevitable yeah. and that's they need they either need to leave or something catastrophic is going to happen like this church will cease to exist and that broke a lot of relationships. Thankfully, there's been a lot of repair. But um, yeah, I just I, I know I have a lot of friends still that are really even going back to the college church. You have these people where their first experience of church was Mars Hill. Yeah. And that first experience also was the, the church they're part of that where there was like betrayal. And yeah. and when you have a system where Mark himself is calling himself the brand and everyone is sort of moving like ants to to support that that's on staff like that's the message that the rest of us receive right and so mark preaches for two hours and you leave church on sunday and the thing you talk about is the sermon Mm -hmm. and talk about mark and mark becomes the center point of the church yeah and i think what's really wild is that somehow working in spite of all that was I still use this language because I think it's good, but the priesthood of all believers, like Mm -hmm. it, it was happening and it was living and it's still in existence even past Mars Hills. Yeah. So I think that that's pretty incredible. And the fact that there is such a, I mean, I can remember, I can remember thinking, okay, you know it's bad when the very mention of your church's name in the community incites like anger and rage mm, yeah. and news articles. It's like that's when you know you've totally screwed up. Lost so, the plot. Yeah. yeah. And so I honestly just felt like the day Marcel closed its, its doors, while I really struggle with how it happened, um, I, I think it was for the best. And I think that cloud lifted from Seattle that day when it finally was like, Mars Hill's no more. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, I have, I have so many questions, first of all, but I, I thank you for sharing all that with yeah. me because it's, you hear so much. Like, you and I, I listened to the podcast that was out and I've heard other people's stories and I've heard most of the stories I've heard is stuff that came from the media, you know, it's mm-hmm. stuff that came from New York Times articles or in like all the different places where this, this, topic and mark and morris hill has been addressed but to hear it come from somebody who lived it is just so is so different so i appreciate you coming here to to share it with me but one of the questions that came to my mind was you had said that kind of the 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 situation you grew up in made you feel inferior around older men Mm -hmm. and that struck me because i'm i have the same kind of situation where Mm. my childhood was much different than, than yours but just the interactions I had with my, my father and things like that. My, uh, my stepfather growing up, it's just, there's a lot of things in there that made a lot very complicated for me. And I, I remember going to like Bible college and seminary and being in churches where it's very male driven yep. and there's these very strong minded men and constantly sitting in, in class, like feeling inferior to all the people around me, because whatever 
it is that little Glenn inside kind of shrinks back in the, in the mm-hmm. company of these powerful men. So I'm wondering when you got involved in Mars Hill, what did that do? Like wh- what did like little Zach for lack of a better phrase, like inside, how did he react around all of that male drivenness? Because again, I'm on the outside looking in, but just listening to some of Mark's sermons and just knowing a little bit of what I do know about like the staff and it's very male driven. It's very loud, yeah. loud, male, loudly male driven, very male focused. Like, was it hard for you on a day-to-day basis to kind of interact with people in that kind of setting? Okay. So I really like this question because there is, I would say a positive thing mm-hmm. that happened in the midst of all that. There were many positive things, but One of those was that, you know, I didn't, I, Marcel was the first church I'd ever come to where they really Mm -hmm. valued the role of a worship leader as something Mm -hmm. more than a person who sings songs. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I'm reading a lot of books I've never read, authors I never heard of. Mm -hmm. And some of it I agree with, some of it I understand, some of it I'm like, this is incredible. And I began to develop a language that I'd never had in my entire life, Mm -hmm. which was awesome, but it also meant that uh i started to become a lot like some of the other Mm. many of the other guys which was essentially i'm i tried to mask my you know little zach yep now this big zach who who has read these books and has the language and can speak like the reformed (laughs) neo-reformed young whatever restless (laughs) theologian (laughs) and has all this language and Honestly, it just was just a, it was just a defense. Mm -hmm. I was insecure. Yeah. And I think what really helped me through and has helped me over the years through a lot of that stuff was just realizing that because I didn't have a dad growing up, I had elevated this view of like grown men Mm -hmm. to a place that was unhealthy. Yeah. And that I just idolized this place of like oh when i'm older i'll be able to do this i'll be more mature and more wise and then i was getting older and seeing that oh some of these guys aren't getting wiser Mm -hmm. and they're not really people i want to be around or people i want to emulate sure and i think that really helped me in that process but Mm -hmm. i can tell you like gosh one of my like i have i have a handful of regrets but one regret i have at mars hill was there was this time we were working on our second record actually. And this, there was this guy who was an intern and he had hit me up and was like, Hey, can we go to lunch with this other guy? Um, this guy, Matt, and can we go to lunch and can we talk about some stuff? Cause I have some questions about the Bible. I was like, yeah, let's do it. We go to lunch and he starts sharing all these things that he's struggling with and doubting about scripture and has all these questions. And I was just, one barely listened to anything he had to say and i was so defensive Mm. and i was just kind of getting frustrated with him and angry and i remember walking away from it like i didn't feel right i don't think that was right and then time went on and for sure i felt that way until eventually i had to message him and like ask for his forgiveness Mm. but nevertheless i just was doing what i saw yeah because i saw people like pastors that would debate with college students and fight with them Mm -hmm. just realize like oh man i'm just doing that because i have those same exact questions and i have the same exact fears yeah and so that was a pretty even though it was hard i learned so much through that experience so like even though i had hard things maybe happen to me or are probably more specifically i think i just carried the weight of a lot of hard things that happened to other people i cared about i too perpetuated some of that because there were people that were vulnerable and want, had questions and I wasn't patient with them and I wasn't honest because I too had the same questions and struggles. So I, I just feel like on one hand, I did develop language that could mm-hmm. allow me to stand with the older guys mm-hmm. and make me <laughs> seem like I, was, I could hang with them. Yeah. But underneath it all, I was really just it was just a a way to mask my own insecurity and just to try and just to be accepted. Yeah. Just wanted so desperately to be seen as someone that like 
was a valued voice at the table sure. because in Savannah, I was the art college student who played music or whatever. And then, you know, and, and now, and now fast forward at Mars Hill, I was the dude at the college church who had really had no, hadn't, hadn't run, read hardly any theology books and yeah. was pretty, you know, illiterate as people <laughs> call me. So, yeah, when you get to your interview, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <It's> theology <books. laughs> I mean, and honestly, like, as embarrassing as it was, in some ways, I look back on it, I'm like, I'm just, it just kind of exposes just the insecurity that was there in so many people and yeah. guys in particular that just yeah. felt this need of like, I need to, I need to show how impressive my knowledge is. And it's just like, okay, that, yeah. people stop listening to you after a while. I certainly experienced that. Yeah. There's a sense where, I mean, even having spent a little bit of time in that kind of world, like it's, there's a sense where it's like intoxicating because it's like, you know, it you, is. especially like if you're somebody who feels inferior to begin with, now, if I can amass all this knowledge and I can defend my positions and I can emulate these other people that I see, you know, defending their positions in almost like a way that's shaming of other people. Like if I can, if I can harness the energy, I can uplift for that negative feeling inside that I have about myself. And the more you do it, it just becomes almost like you can't control it. And it's just yeah, amassing more so knowledge, awful. getting stronger at my debating skills. And like, I remember being in a similar place where it was like, I was reading like the Wayne Grudem systematic theology. I was reading Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict, like all these books, you know, about how to answer the, the questions and, you know, mm -hmm. make the people who have the questions feel insignificant because they don't know the answers like you do. And it's just like, it's, it's, so, I guess it's so intoxicating and you can really lose yourself in it. hundred mm. percent. That's so well put. Yeah. I definitely, I think that that's probably, and I, and I think that's common in so many churches. So many. Know? Yep. I mean, we have the unique privilege with the band, even of just going around to playing so many different things, you know, in different places. And yeah. sometimes we'll play at like Bible colleges and you meet some of the people and you're like, oh, I, I know, I know you're getting a degree and I know you, <laughs> you should work in the church, but can you just consider something else? Right. <laughs> Please, so for sake of us all. That's right. Take a, take a break. <laughs> yeah. Just, just give it 10 years and see if it's something you still want to do. Yeah. So another question I have for you is, you had mentioned like, obviously before Mars Hill, you're in this place where like they ask you what theology books you're reading. You're like, I don't know. And then you go into Mars Hill and now you have this conversation like with this guy, you went out for coffee and he's asking all these mm -hmm. questions. So clearly now you've amassed some knowledge yep. and you've sat under this teaching in some way, shape or form, these yep. two hour sermons, things like that. So it's forming you and shaping you in some way. And then you step out of Mars Hill, Mars Hill goes away and now you're in this other kind of world. So I'm kind of curious about that progression, like sitting under that teaching of Mark, what did that do? Because I, I've, I listened to a few of his sermons back, back in the day, like I, I've listened to him and they come across as very loud, sometimes very yelling, some screaming, shaming, mm -hmm. like finger yep. pointing kind of thing. What did, what did that do, I guess, to your soul? How did that develop? How did that shape your soul, your own walk with God? And then was there a point where you were like, whatever this is doing to me is not personally, like this is not forming me maybe into the way that I want to be formed. And then on the other side of Mars Hill, like what does it look like for you now in terms of mm. your walk with God? Okay, so- Kind of a big question, but I'm looking I, for like that, that journey like of Zach, yeah. I like it. And I, I will say, fortunately, <laughs> I, f I feel like I have a lot more clarity around how to answer that question about myself now than mm -hmm. I did even a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if you're an Enneagram person. A little bit. I, I'm an eight, okay. which I always struggle to tell people that because people have had a lot of eight, uh, bad eight experiences, mm. the, the challenger. And I have come to realize that so much of my eightness, if you will, is mm -hmm. the result of my upbringing mm -hmm. and really struggling to trust people. Yeah. 
because it's always been confusing to me when I tell, especially over the past few years, when I tell people I'm an eight, they're always very surprised. Like, what? I don't think you're an eight. And I've taken this test. I can <laughs> promise you 15 years ago, I took the first one. I was the first time I was an eight and I've taken it so many times, like the most elaborate Enneagram tests. And I always come back and eat. So, <laughs> but I, you know, you do see, you see glimmers of hope as, as time goes on, which is good. You're, I, I, I seem to be growing a little, but um, the thing that I realized is that that whole culture of reading these books and talking about details was just terrible for me as an eight, mm-hmm. because it just gave me a, a reason to feel like I had power yeah. because now I have this information. And so that puts me in this position of someone who people need it's like pouring gasoline on the fire yeah and it was terrible yeah it was awful for me yeah because and and it took once mars hill ended i remember our first sunday it was actually our second sunday we left mars hill we're at this church and uh it's a more liturgical church and the pastor up front it's time for communion he says something i never heard before anyone who's grown up in a liturgical you know tradition will this will be really common but i had never heard it so you know he just said hey you know we've come to the point where you know communion with with jesus and this is our this is the high point of our gathering it's like oh the high point what does he mean by that Mm -hmm. and then there's probably 200 people there maybe 150 they start to come forward and the people he knows he's saying by name the body of christ broken for you glenn the blood of Christ shed for you, another person, blood of Christ shed for you, John, Natalie, you know, all, and I'm just listening in this church building to people's names being spoken. Mm. And it, like, I just start crying. Mm. And it was the most disorienting thing for me because I was realizing that so much of my life has been spent with this idea of love. Mm. God loves you. Like Mark yelled it. Um, other churches I went to, it was more about us loving God, not a whole lot about God loving us. Yeah. Uh, my family, uh, not everyone, but a lot of it was sort of love was just a, it's just, you know, because we're blood, then we love each other. Yeah. And I, I, I was, I mean, I grew up one of the still, I mean, uh, one of the most like hurtful things that was just so formative for me growing up that I was told very often was I love you, but I don't like you. Mm. And, um, and I just carried that with me. And that just certainly like made me feel more and more inferior. Like, what do I got to do to get people to actually like me? Sure. So then, you know, here's my chance reading the books and doing all this. And of course the eight in me that doesn't trust people. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the best way to do it? If I get a lot of information, I don't need people anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I can make other people feel like they need me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really going to necessarily give much to them Mm -hmm. so coming out of mars hill that communion experience for me and that church like it was i'll never forget it yeah yeah because it it just there was something about hearing someone's name yeah being specifically tied to the sacraments and so Mm -hmm. (laughs) That honestly, I just felt a lot of freedom to go through my own sort of deconstruction in that time and being a part of that church. There were, it was the first church I'd ever been a part of where even though they had very, not in a very like, not with like a hammer or something, but they, they definitely had the things that they had their values and their doctrines and all this, but they never let any of that get in the way of inviting people to the table. I love that. Yeah. So I had friends who there and people I was making friends with some who were just like really content in their faith. Others who were, I don't think I believe anymore, mm-hmm. you know, people in the deconstruction stage, people in the asking questions. And it was just this really beautiful thing to be a part of this church where there really was a uh, genuine safety in bringing mm-hmm. those questions. Yeah. And that honestly, I just think, again, it transformed me in a, in a way that has left such a lasting impact on me that um, it, it continues to really inform a lot of the way that I view God and, and live out my faith. And that's, yeah. 
And I don't, and I just, I feel so grateful for that mm. because Mars, every church I'd ever been a part of, it was such, there was such an emphasis without using this word on uniformity. Yeah. And it was everyone needs to think the same, talk the same, dress the same. And that in some ways feels really good. Like I remember moving from St. Louis to Seattle and I was like, oh, my people, they all wear these clothes and they listen to this music and this is so cool. And for a while that feels really great. Yeah. But then you start to realize that it's just for all the good things that it is, it also feeds like the insecure side yeah. of it. It sure. doesn't just want to be an individual. And and so I think that, I mean, per, I mean, a great example of that is even in my marriage you know, my wife and I over the years, you know, you spend all these years in the church and you're like, all right, every decision we make, it's got to be together. And mm -hmm. we always got to be on the same page. And if, if you want this thing, then I got to want that thing. And if I want this thing, then you got to want that thing. And just getting to the place where we're just like, you know what, it's okay to be autonomous too. Sometimes like we want to be together. And a lot of times we'll make decisions together and that's really cool. Yeah. But sometimes it's okay that we're, there can be autonomy and that yeah. isn't a threat to our relationship. Yeah, It's actually a strength, I think, that we can be ourselves and don't have to be someone else. And yeah. again, so much of that happened after that one Sunday of hearing those names being said yeah. during communion. And it just has stuck with me ever since. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's almost like, it seems almost like a, a gift in a sense that you've, you've seen both sides of the coin. You know, I mean, both yep. ends of the spectrum, like you're on that Mars Hill side where it's so everyone, like you said, speaks the same, believes the same, does the same, acts the same, smells the same, whatever. But then yep. you come all the way to this other end and this other church where you're hearing these individual names. There's a sense of like diversity. There's yep. different maybe ideas about different pieces of theology, whatever. And I think that it's such a unique position to be in, to have seen both of those things, because you're able to have such a greater awareness, I think, I would think. And especially yeah. in, in being able to talk to people who are on one of those different sides or somewhere in the yeah. middle, like you've been in both places. So you can speak to both of those, which I think is, which I think is really cool. And I think for me, like just listening to your story, like I came from that, not, it wasn't like a Mars Hill world, but still it was a place of real uniformity, like real, mm -hmm. you got to believe A, B, and C, or you're just not believing right. And if you're not believing right. right, you know, you're destined for the wrong place when you die kind of thing. And so it's kind of about getting your, ideas and your beliefs in order but once I got out of that world and I started to have this podcast and interact with people who bring a variety of different ideas to the table and kind of yeah. look back into those early centuries of Christianity like those first two centuries you know there's tons and tons of different ideas that are floating around out there and they all would identify themselves as Christians people who followed Jesus but they followed Jesus in different ways and that's given yeah. me such a great amount of freedom to not feel like I have to cling so tightly yeah. to my theology and my doctrine to someone comes to me with a different idea, but I can, I can almost look at them and say, like, wow, I, I never thought of it like that before. Like, tell me more yeah. about why you're so passionate about that. And I think that then creates that love and that bond that Jesus tried to get into his disciples head all the way back, you know, 2000 so. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think that we really do. I just, I don't know. I mean, it's not a new thing. I mean, hi historically, it's not even just a Bible or scripture thing. I mean, mm -hmm. or like the Christian or, you know, the Jewish tradition and faith, like it's just history. Like we tend to find people that we, that we sort of like stake claim on and like, this is my leader. That's right. This is the person that's gonna save me you know um and or make this is the person that's gonna make everything better i mean mm -hmm. honestly the last election was certainly that i mean yeah. for on either side yeah. either side believed this person is going to this person is going to fix everything that's wrong yeah and the and it's really the only reason we believe people even think that is because the messaging from those political parties is uh, everything's wrong and yeah. I'm going to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Here's all the problems. Right. Here's what I'm going to and, do. And we just, and, and it's like, if we were just on paper, we'd be like, Oh, no person can do that. Right. No person can do that. Yeah. But we just want to believe that. Yeah. And I think that, 
I don't know. Honestly, the place that I've been even over the past two years with even working on this record is just had a lot of hard, challenging relational things within family over like the way that politics and faith have conflated to a place that I just, it's hard for me to really fully understand. Yeah. Um, and the division that it's brought. And I just started feeling like, you know, there's just not many people anymore that are really making honest and earnest strides to bring others together that are in different places. That's right. And the effort is usually let's get people together to talk about the thing that we don't disagree with and see if we'll agree. And it's like, yeah, good luck there. How many times has that worked? You yeah. know, yeah. I think it has to be something bigger. And that's really been the kind of the, that's been the most significant thing for me over the past, however many years It's just realizing that when I was deconstructing so many things, there was a lot of other things happening in life at the time. I just realized that I, I had this sense that I was going about it in a way that was to, at least for me, and I'm not, this is not a critique of anyone else, but mm -hmm. it just felt like I was coming about it from a place of like too much arrogance where yeah. because I, so many people had failed me and hurt me, mm -hmm. then I get to just immediately assume that God must not be real. I'm like, well, that, okay, what if I just reverse that a little bit? What if I actually assume for a second that I can't trust a lot of people? <laughs> And that people, you know, the way we define love and different things, like by our own standard, it gets really messy. And honestly, when I started to retrace really significant moments in my life, like I still even believe to this day, like I see, I really genuinely believe that God has done really miraculous things in my life that I, 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 just can't attribute to anything else. Like I personally cannot attribute it to anything other than God doing that. And that for me continues to be affirmed the more I hear other people's stories that are different from mine mm -hmm. and a part of even different like faith traditions within Protestantism. Yeah. Um, and outside of that too. And so I, I just feel this growing sense that there is really a concerted effort needed to try and bring people together. And that, that just feels like, I use this language a lot that I just really feel like as a family, my wife and I talk about that through the music, all of it just want to be a bridge Yeah, and bringing people together. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I always say you can, we, we can just because we don't see things eye to eye. doesn't mean we can't go forward arm in arm. And I just, I love the That's idea of just bringing that. people together and our various ideas and beliefs and just we're all human and we're yeah. all trying to just make it through this life and let's just do it together yeah it's so true yeah yeah hey we've just we've overshot our i don't know 35 minutes i said that's just wasn't gonna happen <laughs> but <laughs> we're gonna have to do more because i have yeah. i have more questions for you but can i ask you one more question yeah okay please um for people who are listening who who are deconstruct maybe they're like new to it or they're they're in the thick of it whatever but they grew up under that that you know very strong theology of uniformity and you have to believe a b and c and now they're out kind of in the weeds and they're they're rethinking things what is your advice to that that person who's maybe feeling some some fear about maybe stepping into those waters mm -hmm. or tackling these topics because i we have a facebook group and i put out a group a question the other day and i said you know what's the biggest piece of theology that you're wrestling with right now? Mm -hmm. And the, the answer is varied completely, but it just saddened me so much because so many people are, you know, like, like I'm stuck on atonement or I'm stuck on, you know, this, this thing I heard about hell or I'm stuck on, like, it's just like, there's these pieces of theology that people are stuck on as they're trying to pursue their walk with this divine being who loves them immensely. And so I'm yeah. wondering for someone who's been on both sides of the spectrum, what's your advice to that person who's stepping out of that world and trying to find something um, mm -hmm. deeper to live for, I guess you could say. Okay. A couple of things come to mind and they're all, they've been true for me. They might mm -hmm. not be true for everyone, but I, I do think there's, 
something there. Um, I think the first thing is to really try and define what you're de deconstructing. Yeah. Are you deconstructing God? Are you deconstructing like what people have told you? Are you deconstructing the church? Are you deconstructing yourself and decisions you've made to follow that person or that system of beliefs? Like, I think it's really important to define. And even if you feel like I'm deconstructing everything, I think it's worth just focusing on one at a time yeah. because otherwise in my experience it just will make you really bitter and angry yeah because there's way more voices and people out there that are going to want to fight you and go against you yeah. and not want to try and understand you and it's not even because they don't understand you it's because they're afraid if they say they understand what you mean yeah. that that all of a sudden is going to mean that they are kicked out of the club yeah because it happens yeah so that's the first thing i would say is just really knowing what you're deconstructing not knowing, but just deciding like, all right, mm -hmm. even in that theology of atonement, like, mm -hmm. is it, are you deconstructing the, are you deconstructing your understanding of atonement because of the way it was described to you by a particular group of people? Are you deconstructing it altogether? Are yeah. you deconstructing this? I, you know, like, I just think it's worth really understanding that because what you'll find, you said this earlier go all the way back to the early church, there are millions of people that have gone in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. And I think many of them are helpful Yeah, and, and helpful ways of looking at stuff. Yeah, um, So I think that that is the first thing. And the only other thing I would say is that um, I do think that if the bulk of your time is spent with people who are deconstructing, it just becomes a feedback loop. Yeah. And I know it might be really hard to want to still talk to those people who aren't in the place that you're in. Perhaps they are believing the thing that you're questioning. I just think it's worth staying in relationship with them yeah. and not seeing them as fools because otherwise the thing that you're running from, which is the certainty that everyone has around these big, big ideas, you just go over to the other side and you become... <laughs> A person that's really certain that they're wrong right. and so it's kind of like i just think as much as you can try and find the middle and at least in my experience it's most i've been most often found the middle when i spend the bulk of my time with a variety of people that yeah. are different than me that's good yeah my friend alexander shia says you know make it make a table where everybody's welcome but the only person who perhaps is not welcome is the one who is going to say that they're right and everybody else is wrong, whatever side they might be yep. on. That person could just stand off to the side a little bit until they're ready to take a seat at the yeah. table. But just because somebody is from your former tribe, so to speak, who believes things that you no longer believe, doesn't mean they're not welcome to the table to have a conversation with you, unless they're going to be, of course, shaming and all these other things towards you, then you might have to create boundaries and things like that. But we can all learn from each other. And I think that's an important value to bring into the deconstructing process can i throw one other thing out there do it i know we're way over on time um, <laughs> keep going <laughs> i think too if i could just propose something mm -hmm. to anyone would be to consider reading through the gospels chronologically not just like matthew mark and luke but there's so many there's like helpful guides where it's like all right matthew one through chapter one through one through 16 and then it's the same sure. thing and you know, and Mark, whatever, yeah, or I guess Luke. Um, that I feel like, if I'm gonna be really honest, is if you grew up in the church, I think that we have been massively failed mm -hmm. by being taught scripture and this idea of God through primarily the Old Testament. Yeah, like I think that that is yeah. a fatal flaw. Yeah, and someone might like freak out about me saying that but i i really mean it like i think that if jesus is the one that's sort of like setting the record straight and bringing clarity to some of like the misinterpret many of the misinterpretations that so many of the jewish people had of like the mm -hmm. law and then jesus is is giving us like for the very first time like the image of the invisible god yeah then i think we i, I just i had this really deep conviction a few years ago that i I, I shouldn't really, before I start like questioning everything, I probably should actually know for myself and read for myself, like who Jesus is, That's right. because so much of my understanding of Jesus has just been what other people have told me. And it's oftentimes tacked on to the end of like some sort of like topical 
thing or like some old testament thing and it's like all right cool yeah i just think that that is again like just something worth doing (laughs) and just and take your time with it because i've done it two or three times now and i can promise you every single time it gives me more questions yeah less answers i will i continue to have this belief that jesus spoke in parables to help for as like a means of dignity for people to think for themselves that really pisses people off when i say that but i think that it's true yeah people try and say well it's you know jesus says why he speaks in parables you know because so that you know you know the the seeing would you know would not see and the hearers would not hear and all this kind of stuff and it's like that that's missing the point of what he's trying to say and i just think that there's a lot of really helpful authors and people out there that you'll find are thinking and asking the same questions that you are that are worth reading yeah yeah i came to that similar idea in my own journey was just like i feel like i've i was always taught that like nobody ever said this to me but the vibe i kind of got was well jesus is really nice but you know it's like paul came to tell us what jesus really meant and the old testament you know reminds us of who god really is and you know, it's almost like we've been taught to read Jesus through the lens of Paul and the Old Testament, when in reality it should be reversed. We should be reading Paul and the Old Testament revelation through the lens of Jesus. Yes. And that just brings a whole oh. different element, right? Oh. Yeah. And I feel like yes. I did the same thing you did. Like I put yep. a lot of stuff away for a long time and I just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then I started to read other things like the Gospel of Thomas and all these other different stories of Jesus, just so I can get a better idea of what have followers of Jesus thought of Jesus throughout the course of history yeah. and what is helpful for me to pull into my own journey. And now I feel more comfortable to go back to Paul and to read something. And people don't like when I say this, but to read something from Paul, be like, I don't know that it like lines up with what I see in Jesus. So, I'm totally with you. He was right? a human being. Yeah. Maybe he got it wrong. Oh, yeah. I know. I think about that <laughs> so often that yeah. it's just like, we have to be careful. Like, right. I mean, there's an author, Robert uh, Capen or Capen. Have you ever read him? I've heard of him. I haven't read his stuff. His book, Hunting the Divine Fox, is incredible. But he mm-hmm. talks about how the whole idea of like Jesus as a superhero is totally flawed mm-hmm. because, or like Superman, because Superman, you know, he comes to, you know, he comes from, you know, what is, what is does he come from the planet Krypton? <laughs> I don't know, where, I don't know something where he comes. like that. I, don't know. I wasn't a big Superman yeah. guy, but I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> he comes, he comes here. He disguises himself as like a normal guy. And then all of a sudden, when people need him, he rips off his, his normal guy clothes and he's a superhero and he flies as you know as fast as a speeding bullet and he saves everybody. But then he's got this one thing, this kryptonite that takes him down, but he comes back to life again. Right. And it's like that's so wrong because if we believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man, then he wasn't Superman. That's right. Like he wasn't just like hopping back and forth between i'm wearing my cape and now i'm not like he actually was just a person living yeah Yeah. uh by the power of the spirit so i and i think and he tells us as that much i mean he actually says that he Mm. says that that's how we'll live you know in john 14 yeah so anyway i i just i think i just feel like oh for so many people and i say this as someone who experienced this realizing gosh so much of deconstruction is literally just pull tearing down so many of the stupid things that people have said yeah like and so many of like the narrow-minded things that people have said and some of them mean well they mean well but it doesn't necessarily mean it's something you gotta you gotta go with yeah it's like i'm not really deconstructing god but really deconstructing what i've been told about god yeah growing up and i think there's a it's important it's a small distinction but i think it's a really important distinction to make yeah yeah 100 percent hey zach where can people find you online where's the best place to go to connect with you obviously your music all that kind of stuff Okay, uh, citizens, we're, we are citizens.net. Mm-hmm. You can go there. Uh, and then, of course, Instagram. I don't really get on Twitter that much, if I'm honest. Uh, but we have Twitter that way. <laughs> occasionally. Uh, TikTok, I don't know, all that stuff. You can find us. We are citizens, uh, I think it's, or citizens music on, uh, citizens underscore music on Instagram. And cool. that's kind of the place we live the most, at least awesome. on the social media front. Awesome. I'll put the links in the show notes and I'll be hitting you up. Maybe we'll do it again soon. I'd love to. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you.